the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I want to bid you a warm welcome to this time of worship. I am Pastor Mar Bruner, and this is Columbia United Methodist Church, and we come before God this morning, the God who pours out upon us grace upon grace to, to worship with reverence and awe, to bend our knee, to raise our voice in song, to worship and to pray to the God who loved us most, who loved us first, and who refuses to let us go. Today, we celebrate World Communion Sunday. We are part of this great communion of saints, those that came before us, those that walk with us now, and those that are yet to come, persons from all over the world who love Jesus and who will together celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion as one body of Christ together at the Lord's table. So be sure to gather your communion elements if um, you would like to partake in communion with us today. And we will celebrate with the whole people of God everywhere. But now, friends, let us quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare for this time of worship with silent prayer. We begin our time of worship today with a prayer of confession in which we come before God and confess our shortcomings so that we can accept the forgiveness that God grants to us. The words to our prayer of confession will appear on screen. I hope you will pray with me. Rescuing God, you brought us out of the land of captivity, out of the house of slavery. Forgive us when we willingly return to slavery making divine the machine of production, crafting idols from the excess of consumption. Forgive us when we consider ourselves so grand that we do not rest and enjoy your presence, defining ourselves by our ability rather than your love. Forgive us when we esteem ourselves so little that we dare not rest and sit with ourselves, exposed without the cloak of productivity. Forgive us when we deem our species so central that we do not rest and halt consumption, decimating earth, denying her Sabbath and integrity. Forgive us through Christ, who redeems us from the brokenness of slavery that we might enjoy your presence, creation, and community. Amen. Righteousness does not come from our own doing or not doing. Righteousness comes from God by faith. Through the faithfulness of Christ our Lord, we are forgiven. Let us pray together. Lord God, creator of us all, you desire for us to shape our lives together so that all your children may taste and see that you are good so that we may thrive together in your abundance. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. And now friends, let us sing praisefully the church's one foundation, hymn number 545. <laughs>
It is a joy and a privilege to come before God with our hearts exposed to bring our cares and our concerns, our joys and our celebrations, and lay them all down at the feet of our Lord, who loves us beyond all reason. As we pray this week, we will pray for and with one another, and I would ask you to hold the following persons in your prayer. Bill R. Sally S. Jim C. D. K. Larry. Connie H. and family. Linda R. Edward P. Sharon C. Becky and Heather. Denise S. Raleigh S. Craig C. Tom, Betty, Hope and Bill, Cindy G, Nikki B, Mary M, Stephanie, Keith C, Debbie W, Wilma T, Marsha M, and Lori H. We ask that God would be in the midst of all that is going on, to stand in the gap, to help people who are struggling to feel God's presence, people who are ill to know God's healing, and all of us who, who just need God's presence to know that God will be there providing whatever is needed in whatever ways God knows just how to meet our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Will you pray with me? Holy Protector, you are the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Today we pray for the release of those held captive by cruel governments and human traffickers, by oppressive ideologies and suffocating theologies, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We pray for the release of those held captive by debilitating disease and mental illness, by crippling addiction and chronic fear, we pray for the release of those held captive by crushing grief and paralyzing memories, piercing loneliness and deadening hopelessness, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Release within us your divine compassion and care on behalf of those who suffer, that all may know that you are the Lord our God, who brought us into the land of promise, into the house of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, Lord God, hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Exodus. We will read from chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. This is the New Revised Standard Version. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the wit people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, 
You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The story of God for the covenant community of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us this day. May your word come through me or in spite of me. Amen. So as I mentioned already, we are celebrating World Communion Sunday today. And on this day, we are reminded that Christians from around the world come to the Lord's table to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Christians and Christian unity is something that Jesus continues to call us to, that being one. We pray in our communion liturgy, in fact, every time that we, um, we speak that prayer, we pray that God will make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. And we should always be mindful of this. That the church of Jesus Christ extends to people and to places that we may only ever have heard of. Practicing faith in all different languages and cultures and, and in different ways and expressions, right? But in, in the midst of that, we are one body in Christ, one body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul writes the following, For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. This is 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 13 and 26. Now, how fitting then, on a day where we think of our life together, that our text should be the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. The people of Israel had been brought out of Egypt, called by God to be God's people, God's covenant people. But first, they had to learn what that would look like. Their life together depended entirely on them knowing who God is, and then who they are to be in God, and how they are to live life together as an expression of who and whose they are, so that every member of the community could thrive and share in the abundant life that God was giving to all of them. We are part of a global community today. If you think about it, we are a worldwide community and it is no less vital today than it was there in the desert that we, in this day and age, often carefully look at who it is that claims us and how God calls us then to be in community with one another in ways that honor the sacred worth of every life. The new community of Israel had come from slavery to freedom, and if they were to continue to live in God's freedom in a land of their own, God now gave them the foundation and structure of these Ten Commandments on which to build that life. The opening verses of chapter 20 of Exodus remind the people who it is, who it is that is speaking to them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, declares God. So the foundation and the structure of the Ten Commandments come from God revealing to us who God is, a mighty and powerful God who fiercely loves all God's children, a God who will do anything for us, a God who withholds no grace or mercy or presence or even a tiny ounce of love from us. God calls the people to remember who God is so that they can discover who they are in God. I am first, declares God. 
So put nothing before me. Make me your first priority, the one to whom you give all your loyalty and trust. You see, when God is first, all else falls into place. When God is first, then we automatically begin to seek the things of God, the things that matter to God, and then we begin to do the things of God, the things that matter to God. God warns us that putting God first means also that we do not make or bow down to or worship any kind of idol, any kind of idol. What are the idols that we have in our lives? I think if we really are honest and think about that, we can probably identify some things that tug and pull at our own priorities in this life. Interestingly, the word that is translated as idol in, in Hebrew may also be correctly translated to image. Hmm. So if you translate it to idol, it means don't make some kind of a other thing to worship or you know, bow down to it, something in anywhere in, the, in creation. But if it's do not make an image, then it kind of also kind of adds a nuance to this that we may not have considered. Not only should we then not make things, but we also should not create any image of God that limits and domesticates our infinitely powerful, uncontainable God in any way, shape, or form. In other words, do not try to put God in a box. We are created in the image of God, but how often do we attempt to create God in our image instead? To make God be the way we need God to be, um, so that God will hate all the people we hate, and that God underwrites all our own plans and priorities instead of us following God's. This must not be so. We must not create idols, nor must we make God into an idol that we can control and limit. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, the name of God, for example, is never spoken. Out of reverence for God's holy name, God is God and we are not. And so then comes this third commandment that when we call on God, when we speak God's name, let it be done in a reverent manner, in such a way that honors God, that shares God, that calls to God for help or praise, but does not just frivolously use God's name for just any purpose. Together, these first three commandments give us a picture of, of who God is from God's own lips. Walter Brueggemann writes that God is a holy and jealous God who saves and claims an active and decisive presence in our life together. And in holiness, God is beyond all our efforts at control and manipulations. This is a God who holds us accountable for our sins but is incredibly faithful and steadfast to the thousandth generation of those who love God. Our sins and our shortcomings, therefore, do not undo God's covenant love and presence, nor does it erase the hope that we have in our incredible God. However, our sins do have real-life consequences for our children and for our children's children we have brought so many natural resources to near exhaustion. We have created irreversible water and air pollution and the climate is changing at an incredibly rapid pace to name some of the bigger issues in our world. And if we sit down and we really think through this, if we do some soul searching, we can certainly identify some of our communal and individual sins that bear lasting consequences for our children and our children's children. And once we identify these, well, then we have a responsibility to do something about them because life is about our life together. God calls on the people to remember the Sabbath. This is a day that is to be set apart as holy, a day to completely devote ourselves to God. On this day, all work shall stop. All required activity, productivity, service, everything to anyone or anything other than God. Because God rests, Israel must rest, and we must rest. Sabbath is so crucially important to our lives together. It is commanded for all creation. You'll notice that it's not just the, the, the boss, right? The boss rests. No, everyone in the household, down to the donkeys and the sheep, everyone rests. All must rest 
for the sake of healing and wholeness in body and mind and spirit. We all need opportunities to refresh and recharge. We were not created to run nonstop at this frenetic pace that we set. So on the Sabbath day, many of us attend to matters of worship. We will worship online like we're doing this morning, or we will go to drive-in worship service and worship with one another from our cars. Um, but Sabbath is about more than just that hour of worship. It's a whole day devoted to being in God's presence, to be reminded that God has proclaimed us of being of sacred worth. And that to be all we need to be and all we can be, we need to rest in God. This commandment is not just for the self, for the sake of right relationship with God, but it is also for all those we share life with as well. So this commandment is also then about right relationships with one another. If we are honest, sometimes busyness and productivity in themselves can become an idol in our lives. Everyone and everything needs their rest in body, mind, and spirit. We must not deny anyone and that includes us, right? We don't deny anyone, including ourselves, their Sabbath. It is not ours to deny, nor is it ours to give away. The final six commandments all deal with life together as community. It seems obvious, though. I mean, if you read these, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. We should not murder. We should not take that which does not belong to us. We should not violate fidelity. We should not lie. We should not desire that which is not ours. Of course, we should respect our parents. All these things make a ton of sense. But again, these have added communal dimensions as well. For example, honor your father and your mother. So honor your parents, but not only your parents, but all those in the generations that came before. Recognize and respect the wisdom and knowledge that they have to share. But then we know that honor and respect go both ways. So then also honor the innovation and the new perspectives of younger generations who are working to make life even better than it was in the generation before. So we must not stubbornly hold on to only the way things were because that's the only way, but we should also not be arrogant and to say the generations that came before have nothing to give. We should also not just refrain from literally murdering somebody. I mean, that, that sort of makes a lot of sense. We know that that's not okay. But don't murder people in other ways either. All life is sacred to God because all life belongs to God. And we should always be working to protect and build up our life together. Often we are guilty of limiting and robbing others of life by our action and our inaction. It also matters what we don't do through hate or indifference or selfishness or greed or whatever it is that makes us not act when we should. Is this any less murder? Each of these laws has this added communal dimension. All life is sacred to God and it should be honored. We should not destroy it or be unfaithful to it or steal it or lie about what is happening to it or desire more than we need of the resources that we all share. When Jesus speaks of the commandments in the Gospels, and he often does, he rarely refers directly to specific commandments in general, but he, he discusses them in such a way that makes it clear that these are the entry points into the next stages of the disciples' journey. We need to learn who we are in relation to who God is. So we are who we are because of who God is and because we're in relationship with God. We are shaped and then we are in relationship with one another through being in relationship with God. Only then can we seriously engage Jesus' various calls for us to go, to come, to follow, to give, to serve, to do all the things that is a part of the call of discipleship. Of course, we are not very much unlike those, those uh, Israelites who are standing in the desert. They just heard these incredible words. But Exodus 18 verse 19 make it clear that what they witnessed this day filled them with terror. 
I mean, you can imagine <laughs> this incredible self-disclosure of God must have been terrifying to behold in person. There's thunder and lightning and smoke and fire. And, and they heard the trumpets and they heard God's voice speaking these words from the mountain as God was speaking them to Moses. And they were terrified. <laughs> How often are we terrified when we consider what it is that God is asking of us, what God is calling us to? But let us center ourselves in God. God is still calling us today to be a community not just a community within our church walls, not just a community within our community around the church walls, but a global community, the great community of believers that span this entire globe so that we can be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. So today, as we approach the Lord's table, let us stand in awe of the one who graciously invites us to it. Let us hold space for the fact that not just we, but all are invited by the one who called us together. Let us be one in Christ, one body with many and diverse parts, all working together to be the salt and the light of the world. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. So let us draw near in faith, having made our humble confession and prepared to believe and receive this holy sacrament. So lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God because it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. You made us in your image to love and to be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Holy Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this. In remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with, Christ, with the church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. I will now ask you to take your bread or crackers or whatever you am prepared. You may also take communion in spirit. But as you take this bread, remember that this is the body of Christ, which was given for you. Amen.
Take now the juice that you have prepared. And as you drink it, remember that this is the blood of Christ which was given for you. And now, friends, please join me in praying together the prayer after communion. Most bountiful God, we give you thanks for the world you have created, for the gift of life, and for giving yourself to us in Jesus Christ, whose holy life, suffering and death, and glorious resurrection have delivered us from slavery to sin and death. We thank you that in the power of your Holy Spirit you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We are your children, and yours is the glory now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, may the love of the Creator who rescues us from slavery, the grace of the Savior who redeems us from brokenness, and the peace of the Spirit who moves us into freedom surround you, uphold you, and sustain you now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Go in grace and peace.